All right, welcome back to another episode of Travel Ball Talk. I'm your host, Rich Prado, owner of Play in School. Today we're heading out out to the middle of the country, out there to Kansas to, to visit with Luke Town, uh, owner, uh, founder of Advanced Baseball Academy in the Kansas City, Kansas area. Right, Luke? How you doing, man? Yes, that's, that's, that's correct, Trent. Yep, I'm right here in the Overland Park area of Kansas City. I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Rich? Uh, I'm doing okay. I appreciate you coming on. You and I have had a couple of uh, a couple of quick calls before hitting record today. I'm excited to learn more about you. I know there's some things that you're passionate about um, that I think I think the entire community can can get behind the entire baseball community. Um, so you know I'm I'm anxious to talk about those things. Um, yeah, so so you're in the Kansas City area by way of Nashville, Tennessee, but I'm not going to spoil or alert. You can tell your own story. Okay. Why don't I why don't I hand the mic? Why don't you why don't you kind of talk about your journey uh from, you know, from from your youth to uh to where we are today um built building a brand new building. So so let me get out of the way and and you sort of introduce yourself and Eventually, you'll get to advanced baseball, I'm sure. Okay, all right, yeah. So, um, I played a little college ball um, after high school. Um, got injured. Um, ended up with a uh, rotator uh, cuff tear, super spinatus, and a labrum tear. And, you know, my 94-mile-an-hour fastball was done, you know. So, um, I, I started coaching in 1990. I'm still very passionate about the game, and, I coached a little bit when I was in high school, just kind of helping out with some of the youth teams and, you know, trying to share some of the stuff I knew, thought I knew back then. You know, as a 20-year-old kid, I really didn't have much um, much experience, you know, other than you know, basically how to be an athlete. Um, so I, I, I've been a musician since I was four years old. I started playing guitar at four, and by the time I was seven, um, I started playing my, my first gig with my grandparents. Um, throughout the uh, uh, throughout the eighties and stuff, I was um, I was a musician, uh, front man. I had a rock band at one time. Um, after my baseball career kind of ended, I was still in school. I was uh, studying meteorology and uh, psychology, and was very interested with those two subjects. And then, you know, that music bug was still biting on me, and so I kind of you know changed directions. And um, I went down a path of, um, of music and um, signed my first uh, record deal in 1990. Um, it's, it's one of those things that in the music industry, it's a, it's a very, very, very tough industry to break into. Um, you have to stand out in ways. And one thing I learned early on is that business was a bigger word than music. And so I started learning how to do the music business side of it. And uh, so I, I paid a lot of attention to um Asked a lot of questions to managers and lawyers and different things like that. And, you know, the record company wasn't really interested in my sound or my, you know, or my music at that time. So I formed three companies and um, took off and went down the road and, and uh, you know, had a really good group of experienced musicians behind me. And and throughout my uh, my career, those same guys stayed with me pretty much the whole time. Uh, signed my first record deal in 1994. And then um, I, re- I retired in 2005. I got I got divorced in uh, uh, night in 2001. And uh, in 2005, I decided that I needed to take care of my family. My ex-wife uh, had a little bit of issues with mental illness, and my boys needed me. So I was raised where it's God, family, career, and I walked away from my career. And and I have any regrets. I think the good Lord kind of puts you on a path for a reason, and you just kind of kind of follow His lead. And that's kind of what I did. Um, so I started studying biomechanics heavily in uh, 2000. Started getting back into it, and I worked with some. Uh, I've worked with some of the best biomechanics physiology guys in the country. Um, was introduced to uh, guys, you know, over time. Was introduced to guys like uh, Ron Wolferth, uh, Randy Sullivan, um, n- numerous guys throughout the uh, the throwing world. And uh, met a guy named Franz Mosch. And uh, whenever Franz comes over, he's from uh, Europe. Whenever he comes to the United States to talk about, you know, uh, biomechanics, kinesiology, or anything, like that, I'm there. So I really got into the science of it because I wanted to understand why I got injured, and um, I didn't want to. Ma- I wanted to make sure that any the students I was working with, if they didn't get injured, so I got really got into that that side of it, and uh, 
Um, so I started coaching out of high school in uh, 2005 in uh, one of the largest 6A schools in the state. And uh, I was there for six years. And in the six years that I was there, there was seemed to be an epidemic of suicide in that school. There was seven seven kids commit suicide in that school in the six years that I was there. Two of those kids I, I knew. Um, so uh, and the first time I seen one of my former players laying in a casket, I got to be honest with you, it changed so much. I would say before that, I was a transactional coach. I was the type of coach that would, uh, if you made a mistake, I felt like it was a reflection on my ability to coach. I was embarrassed by it. Like, you know, I would get, uh, I'd get mad at that. I would uh, chew a kid's butt. I'd pull a kid out of the game. Um, you know, and I expected the kids to play at the, at the last level that I had played at. And, um, you know, which just wasn't reality. You know, and he, you know, freshman and High school and freshman, juniors, and seniors in high school just don't have that same, um, you know, power and strength and knowledge that you do when you're in your, you know, twenties, uh, you know, or late teens, twenties. So, um, um, but I would, you know, I was a, a typical transactional coach. I, I mean, I expected to win, and the winning was more important than the development. After uh, seeing that first kid laying in a casket, I kind of did it about face. I mean, it, to this day. It still bothers me. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Hold on a minute. <laughs> yeah, don't take so, your time. Uh, so I decided that uh, I didn't want to be a part of the problem that these kids were facing. Um, I wanted to be part of the solution. I read a book by Joel Ehrman called Inside Out Coaching. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time that I'd actually heard the term transactional coach. And then I'm reading what Joe is describing. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is this is me. You know, the, 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 the added stress that I've been putting on these kids, expecting these kids to be perfect, is actually causing them, um, you know, mental problems. It, it's actually affecting them long term. So that, I was also introduced to the term transformational coach. That's the first time I'd ever heard that. Transformational coaches care more about development of the player and the relationship with the player than they do about wins and losses. You know, if, if a player makes a mistake now, I'm just like, hey man, get the next one. Mm-hmm. And I learned, I learned to take ownership for how my athletes uh, played. You know, if a, if a kid was struggling on you know, a drop step to a fly ball and I haven't really worked on that with a player, I can't really get mad at the player. I just, I just tell him, say, because I know what he's to work on. You know, uh, we need to work on routes and angles and stuff in the outfield, and we need to work on that drop step, you know. I said, hey, that's my fault. I'll own it. Uh, you just keep going out there and have fun. So I think that, you know, even as a, as a very competitive program, we're, we're very competitive across the, across the country. Um, I, I, I think the reason why my kids play so well is that I stay out of their way. Um, I, you know, so I started studying why a lot of these kids were, you know, committing suicide. You know, I don't have a degree in psychology. I'm not a doctor. I'm not, I can't give kids psychological advice or anything like that. But I can give them a lot of common sense advice. <clears throat> you know, and um, so I, I believe that, you know, the study that I, that I was doing with different psychologists, psychiatrists, sports psychologists, and I've interviewed a lot of people. I've introduced, interviewed a lot of college coaches. I've member of the, been a member of the ABCA since 2005. I've been a member of the NFCA on the fast pitch side since 2016. And I've, I've asked a lot of questions with veteran, other veteran coaches. And I've asked them what's causing these kids to commit suicide. Why is there such a, why is this becoming such a problem? You know, and, and it, oh, you know, there's, it's anxiety. It's uh, you know, depression. What's causing that? You know, and so I, I got to look it back into it, and a lot of it goes back to their their youth experiences um, with perfectionism. Uh, a lot of kids are, have a lot of pressure from different areas to be, to be perfect. Uh, perfectionism in um, you know with in the school and in their sports, their daily lives. You know, um, and so just kind of diving into that. You know, I just I think that there's a lot of pressure coming on these kids that's, that's unnecessary. So in our program, we take that away. We we take that pressure away. You're not. We don't expect to be perfect. In fact, how 
how I run this program is that if I add struggle to everything they do. And I think in today's society, a lot of the, the, the parents and coaches want to remove the struggle. You know, if, if, if I'm doing tryouts and I see a kid that has some athleticism but lacks skill set, and I can see he's projectable, I'll, I'll take that player in a heartbeat. You know, boy or girl, I'll take that player in a heartbeat. But they just need time. They just need time for somebody to work with them and to spend time and love them. So, it's a, it's a, it's a this is this is this is really uh, this is some deep some deep topics and um, you know there's one one sort of observation over the last I don't know twelve months there's been almost feels like epidemic level of uh, kind of like high profile. Um, suicides and attempted suicides at the college level yeah. college athletics and, and it's and it's really yeah. heartbreaking and it and it almost and then and then to sort of um stitch that together with with this other comment that you made about this um this feeling of perfectionism and you can you can almost see where like if a kid feels like they've been perfect for so long and then all of a sudden they're not uh, how that could be uh, anxiety inducing, which I, I call that the pedestal effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good the word pedestal, for it. The pedestal effect is very, very damaging. Yeah. Uh, take a parent of an eight year old. I have, I have eight year olds in my program. Yeah. Eight year olds are like herding cats. It's mm-hmm. fun. It really is. Uh, and, and they're, they're blatantly honest. Eight years old. They're blatantly honest. They haven't learned how to BS the coach yet. You know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, they're fun though, but if you, you, you take a kid and you, you got a parent who's all gung ho, it's their oldest kid, and oh my god, my kid, look how good my kid is, uh, you know, he's like, ah, yeah, he's 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 pretty solid, and then, then the next thing you know, the the parents bragging about him, he goes, oh my god, he's he makes every catch, he never drops a ball, uh, he look how good he hits, mm-hmm. and so they do these bragging sessions in front of this kid, um, but I think a lot of it further what. Why are the parents doing this? Well, I think it goes back to society. I mean, we live in a fake book, fake book world. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at a lot of what parents are doing, they project this perfect world that they live in on social media. And then, so then, you know, kids follow their parents on social media, not so much eight-year-olds, but yeah. 11, 12-year-olds, they're on social media stuff. And and uh, so they, they, they see what their parents are saying. They go, oh, my God, my dad thinks I'm perfect. You know, man, you know, hey, I make a routine catch, and, and man, it's, man, I'm good. You know, parents are constantly saying, goes, man, you're so talented. You're, 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 you're so smart. You know, you're God, you're God-given talent. I'm a professional musician, and I started playing at four years old. I do not believe in talent. I do believe in genetics, but I don't believe in talent. Yeah. Uh, nobody, there's not anything that helped me learn to play a guitar and understand music and music structure and learning the Nashville numerical system and, and what a blue scale is, you know, what all these different things. Nobody, I learned all that stuff. That's Somebody had to teach it. To yeah, me. that was work. That was work. Yeah, and I put in hours and hours. Yeah. Um, you've heard of the, um, the, the, the book Outliers. Yeah, of course. Ma- Malcolm Gladwell. I love that book. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, during my my youth, you know, when I was in from, from four or five years old all the way through eighteen, I logged in ten thousand hours of of uh, time with that instrument. So I, that's why I just don't when when you say things as a parent or a coach, because man, you're so. All right, we had a little technical difficulties. We're back. Um, you were you were talking about how you put in your ten thousand hours as a kid, and and and, and today's parents are are sort of. Uh, you know, pr- praising their kids so much. Now, p- try and pick up if you can remember your where you were in yeah, your I, thought. I, I, I don't. So, I mean, a lot of so I, what I see and what I mean by the, the pedestal effect is that I see parents that are that are constantly bragging on their kids and thinking that that, that they're, they're, they're talented. Um, and like I said, I, I do believe in genetics. I mean, I've I, you know, being in, by, in the science world so much. I, I genetics are real, um, but I don't believe that. You know, you, you're God gifted to, to uh, 
you know, just all this crazy talent. It just doesn't exist. But when you tell a kid you're so talented, and then when they hit a struggle, you know, and they um, they run into a where the game gets harder. Yeah. Then all of a sudden it's like, well, what happened to my talent? Well, what happened yeah. to it was is that you thought all this time that you were talented, and you didn't put in any work. You didn't work to com- improve your skill set. You didn't work as when you get to high school to improve your body. Um, you know, you you bigger kids have a disadvantage when they're bigger kids at a younger age have a disadvantage than smaller kids at, at you know, 12, 13, 14. 12, 13, 14 year olds that are, you know, I've, I've got a kid that's right now is like 6'2 at 13 years old and he's 200 pounds. <clears throat> and I have to stay on him and stay with his parents and go, look, this is easy for him right now. He dominates his age group. Right. Um, you know, but we, we, we have to make sure that he understands that he has to continue to work or he's going to get passed up. He has an advantage he's physically against his peers, yeah. but a disadvantage because he's not getting um, that, that, that struggle, the, the, the yeah. advantages of the struggle yeah. and the failure, and, yeah. and which, which to tie to sort of go back, um, you know, that, that, that kid who, all of a sudden he gets to college he's never dealt with with adversity with failure with struggle and now he's on a big stage and he yeah. he, he or she feels this perceived uh all of a sudden imperfection for the first time they felt nothing but perfection all of a sudden they're on a on a bigger stage and yeah. and and what i like about the way you describe how you approach it you want your kids feeling that routinely right in a in a, in yeah. a in not 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 to use you know in a safe space right like i'm you know i think yeah. a lot of times we talk about yeah. safe spaces in a in sort of a making fun sort of way but it really is in a low risk uh environment where hey yeah. we're 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 you know we're gonna kick this ball we're gonna strike out we're gonna we're gonna yeah. walk a guy and it's not on it's not a life or death situation. It's not the world series. It's not the championship game. This is just, it's just us here and you're going to fail a whole yeah. bunch. So that then fast forward when it is a big stage, if you fail, not if, but when Yeah. it's not going to, it's not going to be like, it's the first time you've ever be. felt that. Yeah. It's like, Oh, well, I, I know how to handle this. So in, in our program, you know, we believe I have, you know, I have sayings and stuff, and I write articles and stuff about my parents. I write articles all the time to my parents. Mm-hmm. And one of the articles that I've written is called The Struggle Makes It Stronger. And yeah. In it, I tell an old fable of a, uh, of a grandson with his grandpa, and he finds the grandpa has this cocoon with a butterfly. And uh, the grandson wants the cocoon. He says, no, no, I, you're not responsible enough for this cocoon. He goes, but grandpa, I want the cocoon. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, I, I promise I'll take care of it. He goes, I just don't think you're responsible enough for it. He goes, okay, grandson, I'll let you have it. But you have to understand that when, at some point, this, this butterfly is going to try to pop out of this cocoon, and whatever you do, don't help it. And so the mm. grandson takes the cocoon, and he he's uh, he holds on to it for a few months goes by, and and uh, the butterfly starts to struggle inside the cocoon. He's watching it. He gets impatient. You know, he's not allowing time. So he gets impatient, and he says, oh, I, I want this butterfly. I want to see. So there's a little bit of hole in the top of the cocoon. He takes a little pair of scissors, and he cuts just a little bit of slit just to help it just a little bit. So the butterfly struggles a little bit more, and he pops out. When he pops out, his wings are undeveloped. Mm. The butterfly can fly. And so the butterfly dies. So the little boy goes back to his grandpa, and he says, Grandpa, I, I don't know what happened. He died. And he, grandpa looks at it, and he goes, well, his wings are not developed. He goes, you helped him, didn't you? And he goes, what? well, it was just a little, it was just a little bit. I just helped him a little bit. He goes, yeah, but that little bit you helped him took away from his struggle. Because that struggle inside that cocoon, when he's beating those wings against that cocoon and trying to get out of that cocoon, he's actually forcing blood flow to his wings, and it makes his wings stronger. It makes his wings bigger. Mm-hmm. So by helping him, you know, it hurts him. So it, the moral of the story is the struggle makes him stronger. Yeah. And so many parents and coaches today don't want to take the time to, help their kids struggle, help them through that struggle. And here, we welcome it. Yeah. We welcome the struggle. I mean, when, 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 I, when I'm at a game with one of my 12-year-old teams, I have like 35 teams. 
And I, I try to go to as many games as I can and watch my teams. I watch my coaches. I watch my players. I watch my parents. Mm-hmm. And um, I go out on the field and I help coach and, and uh, I get in a dugout and I harass them. You know, I tease them. And, you know, I give them great coaching advice, like try not to suck. You know, that's kind of <laughs> coaching advice. I can Keep it light. Yeah. I, 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 I want it to be fun. And then when I see them struggle with something, I go, yes, that's the coaching moment. That's what I'm looking for. And they come off the field, and I'm like, hey, baby, way to get back up, man. He goes, I dropped the ball. I said, yeah, you took a tower out to the ball. I said, hey, man, but guess what? That's how you're going to learn. I said, I pat him on the back. I'm not mad at you. Yeah. He said, you'll get the next one. Just hang in there. You'll get it. And uh, I said, we'll, we'll work more on it, training. So, and, you know, it's, it's, it's so much a travel ball. Is about how many games you play, and that drives me crazy in this industry. Mm-hmm. How many games you play? So I, I sit on the NFCA board. I'm on a travel ball committee there. I'm on a the, the travel ball committee with the ABCA, and it's not the travel ball committee one year for the NFCA. And we're having a meeting, and we got travel coaches in at the convention, and we're having this big meeting, and they're talking about the number of games we're playing. There was some team out of California, and I, I, I know who it was. But I'm not going to mention it. This guy stood up and bragged about his 13 year old girls played 110 games in a year. And I stood up and I said, you ought to be arrested for child abuse, man. Oh, my God. Do you know anything at all about repetitive use injuries? Do you know anything at all about burnout? Why in the hell will those kids want to keep playing yeah. when they get to be 18 years old because you completely burn them out? Mm. They have no life outside of, of softball. And it's just, I hear that stuff and I just cringe. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, it's an overzealous coach and overzealous parents going, we got to play more games. No, you need to train. You want to get good at the sport? You need to train. And you need to train right. And you need to have consistency in your training. You need to have consistency in your language. You need to have consistency in the mental approach. So at, at ABA and AFA, we spend a lot of time, we focus on three, three different areas. Physical, mental, and emotional. And we spend a lot of time on the emotional sport. We have a program called impact that's our philosophy impact is is my solution is the recipe and i and i put this together with a buddy of mine he's a partner of mine in a different different business uh guy's name's todd johnson todd's been with me since uh 2011 uh, when we started aba um my wife and i started aba back in 2011 todd come in that same year he was one of my first teams to come in and uh, when todd come in he was a classic transactional coach and I'd already started on this journey, so Todd and I've kind of been on this journey together. And um, so we come up with a formula called impact. And I believe it's like a chili uh, recipe. Uh, so impact's an acronym for integrity, motivation, positive, accountability, courage, and time. So we implement impact in everything we do. Every meeting we have, every training session we have, it's in our private Instructions. It's in our team. It's in our game. It's in every everything we do. Because I I believe that I've been using this system now for since 2015, and I've seen the difference that this that this makes. So since 2011, 100 percent of my seniors have gone to college to play ball, except for the COVID year. Um, and since the COVID year, the whole recruiting industry has kind of changed a little bit. Now I have kids that are. Some of my kids decide they want to continue to play travel ball, but they don't really want to go to college to play ball. I've, I've run into that. I'm like, that's okay, man. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay if you don't want to go to college to play ball. It's a commitment, man. I get it. I was there one, at one time. Mm-hmm. But it, it's okay. But the, the things they're learning from the sport is life skills. They're learning how to deal with op- opposition. They're learning how to deal with people they don't like. They're learning how to deal with all this different adversity that life's going to throw at you. And when life throws it at you, that's when I get excited. Because when I see those opportunities in this in this sports world, um, you know that that's what it becomes. That's what it becomes fun in the winter time. So here in the Midwest, you know we don't, we have four seasons here. So um, from November through February, we are we're doing training inside. So all of my teams come in, and I run ninety five percent of these training sessions all day on Saturday and Sunday. So we do an hour of training each month is a different. Um, different set. So like the entire month of November, November, we focus completely on base running. Um, I kind of shut down the arms a little bit, start re- recover.
recovering, do rest stuff. We, we still throw. We just do recovery throwing and, and things like that. But um, we, we, we focus on base running. Uh, we, we teach good base running, bad race training. And a lot of the things I've learned from coaches from the ABCA and the NFCA, well, I implement that stuff in them. That's why I go to these conventions mm-hmm. so I can learn stuff. So um, we uh, um, December is our specialty month. We, we start working on different things, controlling the base running, uh, back picks, uh, first and third plays, butt defenses, uh, you know, some, some more strategy to the game. Start teaching it to them. That's cr- <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking how crazy it is that a uh, that a, a quote unquote travel team is is uh, teaching and focusing on small ball stuff. That's that's uh, oh yeah. That's um, you you would be seen as a as a crazy man in the industry for for oh, that. Yeah. Oh, I am, and until you play one of my teams at that 17, 18 year old level, and um, you know my guys know how to defend bus. My job is to get these guys ready. You know, through the through the through the baseball world, softball world, is to get them ready to step on the field at a college level and understand how to play the game at a higher level. You know, the the baseball IQ I think is the sixth tool that very few people talk about. And so, learning how to you know you you know I, I will play small ball against you. I mean, I play some of the best competition in the country. I I love playing GBG and and playing Mike and uh, you know CBA and the Canes and uh, all of them. I love playing those guys. They help us get better. For sure, they really help us get better. I mean, I, a lot of my a lot of my players aren't the same. I mean, they, they have a huge pool to, to pull from. Yeah. Okay. I don't have that huge pool. I have a team that I've had since they were twelve years old. It's been playing together since they were twelve years old. That's played up, and I've been training them. They've been helping them with their their physical conditioning and their strength and their mindset and all this different stuff. And they're able to step on the field and compete with them. Uh, for the most part, college coaches love our players. Um, because they're 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 mentally tougher. Uh, they they're able to understand that. Hey, as a freshman, I'm probably not going to see a whole lot of playing time on a varsity. But guess what? I'm going to come put my work in. I'm going to put it in every day because they've learned to fall in love with the process and surrender the results. And it's, I think if coaches would focus a lot on that, hey, focus on the process here. Surrender the results. The results will take care of themselves. You know what? What is your end game? To win this game? Or to get drafted, or to get you know go to a college and play ball. What what's your in game? I have no problem sacrificing a game, running a first and third play that needs to be run. That's the right call to make. I have no problem sacrificing that game, knowing that tying run. Um, if if we throw this ball away, it's going to, to to two. I have no problem sacrificing this win because that player needs to learn how to execute that in a pressure situation. Once again, that's a coaching moment. That's a struggle that I need to be make sure that they're doing instead of playing it safe we win our share of games we're competitive you know uh, every year we go down to to uh, florida and play in the prospect select events down there and play the palm beach classic and briar and all that stuff with aaron uh, bladeworth and all those guys i love those events i absolutely love those events because i'm playing east east coast guys uh these guys are coming from texas and the west coast to some of those events and they're a huge event lots of scouts there I love playing those guys. I played a Puerto Rican team this year that was like playing a minor league team. <laughs> and my, my 17 and 18 year old, they're third baseman threw the ball across the infield at 101 mile an hour. <clears throat> they had a right fielder that was at 98 mile an hour. Their shortstop was at 97 mile an hour infield velo. Um, these guys crushed the ball. They had a pitcher that was just lights out. And that kid just, he could, he could dot it. They beat us 7 to 1. Who I walked off the field going, whew. I'm glad it was only 7-1. It could have been 17-1 in no time. Those guys were really good, but those guys helped my team get better. Yeah, that's a gr- great that's perspective. Right, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, at the end of the day, I, I told my guys afterwards, I said, boys, you ain't going to see a much better team than that. I mean, I, honestly, it was like playing a little minor league team where guys are in rookie ball because those guys were really good. And you want to talk about struggle? I talked to the coach of that team, and so uh, – seven or eight of those kids, and I don't remember, I think it was seven, of those kids moved here from Puerto Rico, from poverty. Yeah. And there's seven of these kids are living in one apartment in Orlando. They don't hardly have food. Yeah. When, uh, the coach went to pick them up. The kids were like, hey, coach, can we go buy a grocery store? You know, we haven't eaten. Uh. We'd like to get some groceries. And so they go by the grocery store, and, and they haven't had any groceries for, for a few days. And they, they've got a tutor that's helping them with the English. They've got a tutor that's helping them with 
with their grades. And, and every day these kids got to go out on their own and train. So you want to talk about a difference maker? If you look at where those kids are coming from, that's a struggle. You know, these kids born with a silver spoon in their, in their mouth, they're not struggling. Yeah, you know, I, I want to I wanna circle back um, and, and get in, get inside sort of like if we were if we were there with uh, with you and and your players and parents and you talk about how y'all kind of train the mental aspect and I know a lot of this has to do with the sort of the uh, the mental health perspective. What are you know what are what are some of the things that you guys are are doing? What are y'all saying in that in that conversation? How are you being supportive or, or how would you recommend other coaches be supportive to that teenage kid as well as the parent of that teenage kid? Like what, what are, what are some of those discussions like? So in the winter time, during the winter training, <clears throat> they do an hour of physical training. And then they do a half hour of bold. Bold is, stands for brave on life's decisions. And that's where we tackle things that, that these kids need to do. First off, that's where we teach the impact model. We teach, we spend a, a week or, or each week we cover a different letter. And so like we have a session where we have an integrity. Now I have kids from eight to 18 in my program. So my high school kids get the opportunity to become bold ambassadors. That means they get to give back to the, to the game. <clears throat> so all their time that they spent during the bold classes when they were younger, they now become bold ambassadors. Think of it as a big brother, big sister program. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm helping these, 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 these older kids too because they're learning what their role is and how, how responsible that they are. Their actions are being mimicked by the younger kids. So when they, when they come into the facility and they're training – and they've got these, you know, little brothers, little sisters running around, and we, we mix them. I mean, our softball and baseball program are intermixed. So I have girls coming in for the boys' bowl program. I have, I have boys coming in for the girls' bowl program. And, and we, we take away those barriers about the, the sex, you know, about the athleticism of different sexes. I mean, it's such, such bullshit anyway. Uh, but uh, but when we, 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 we take that stuff away from them and we start teaching those things and we we dive into topics that these kids are dealing with like bullying um, yeah oh my god i can tell you so many stories about how many how many times my kids my players have intervened in bullying situations in in their in their in their schools <clears throat> and i've had teachers reach out to me principals reach out to me parents reach out to me and talk about one of my kids stepping in front of somebody and stopping a bullying situation or removing that kid out of it or taking that kid under their wings to keep that bully off of them, you know. Um, <laughs> I've got some. I got some great stories. We're uh, we're 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 sort of dealing with here uh, locally a um, a hazing situation of a of a on a football program where a good buddy of mine is the head baseball coach and and I tell you, there's two things I can't stand is a bully and 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 ha- and hazing. And you, you ask, you look, you look at, you look at a, um, so the older, the older kid hazes the younger kid. Why? Because when he was a younger kid, the older kid hazed him. Why did they do that? Because when he was the younger kid, the older kid, and, and to me, that's, that's like, that's the, that's the dumbest reason why. And I, I do not believe that that creates any kind of camaraderie. Or that's not team building. Not to get into the details of this, but there there will probably be arrests. There will probably be charges filed. The kids will be expelled. The entire season will probably be canceled. This was like super serious, um, wow. and and it's and it's like, um, you know, it's 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 gross and terrible and 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 sad that again these kids. Why did they do it? Because somebody did it to them. What do they what, what do they say about? hurt hurt people hurt people you know what i mean it's like it's 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 like a miserable cycle right um yes and 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 and, yeah so so talking about the bullying situation is it man talk about talk about an important topic if you if you can just sort of like break that chain all you gotta do is step in his way step in his way absolutely you you know in a in a safe manner we actually teach techniques on how to handle them, and there's multiple ways to handle them. But the one thing we teach our kids is that you cannot stand by and do nothing. If you're doing nothing, 
you're basically telling that bully it's okay to do what you're doing. Correct. If you turn if you turn a blind eye and walk away from it, you're basically saying it's okay. And, and you're, you're you're telling that kid that's getting picked on that it, it's okay. To, it's okay to be, um, you know, you, you deserve it. That's what, that's what it's a terrible thing. It's an awful thing. Yeah. So uh, that's the thing that we want to break. But we also cover topics like drugs, alcohol abuse. You know, I found this kind of funny, but I've had a lot of people tell me this, that I'm one of the very few places in the country that actually drug test my athletes. Wow. Drug testing. So when, when you're a freshman in my program, you, you and your parents are going to sign a release that's going to allow me to drug test you. You fail a drug test in my program, you're out. Wow. One, two, three strikes, you're out. That's really interesting. I, You know what? That question would have never, I mean, gosh. And it's and it the, the thing is, it's like, it's so, um, it's, it's, it's sort of like the media, you know, I'm just thinking about some of the shows I watch that, that are really, they, they glorify the drugs and alcohol at the high school age group. And, know. you know, I'm sitting here watching, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the show on Netflix. It's called Outer Banks and the behavior uh-huh. of these kids, you go, wait. Wait, these are supposed to be high school kids, and yeah. it's just like it's you know it's tons of glorification of drugs and alcohol. It would have never dawned on me to implement that kind of um, you know that that kind of of um, uh, of, of rules, and, and and I don't mind it. Like I I kind of I kind of appreciate that. Have I've you, only had two years where I did did not kick out an athlete. I've only had wow. two years. So they know it's coming. And, uh, they know they know it's they a know possibility. It's and year yeah. after year, they're going to see at least one kid who's asked to leave. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And so he, he, here's what that does. I mean, I think a lot of parents. <laughs> and I'm not dogging on parents. There's a lot of great parents out there. There's sure. a lot of parents out there who are afraid to parent their kids. For sure. Uh, meaning that, you know, I have no problem drug testing. I mean, I, I grew up in the oil field business. I mean, my, my family's in the oil business. I grew up in a, on a rig when I was 13 years old. I did not screw with my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, if my dad told me he was going to do something, come hell or high water, that's what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. You, know, um, uh, you know, I learned a lot of lessons from my father. I learned a lot of lessons about life through the oil business. Uh, I learned a lot of crazy stuff about the music industry. You know, the music industry has this perception that when you're in the music industry, it's just common that you um, you drink a lot, especially in the country music business. You know, there's a lot of alcohol, yeah. a lot of drugs. Not, not in my world. There wasn't one of my musicians that was a drinker or did any kind of drugs. I drug tested my my, uh, my guys. I've never been high or drunk in my life. I'm 52 mm-hmm. years old. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I'm, I'm not knocking other people who drink. I mean, I, I just chose not to. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I bring this. You, you can't be a, hey, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Kids, kids won't, won't listen to what you say. They'll mimic what you do. They'll mimic your actions. Yeah. You know, the, the, best, the best phrase I've heard about that is, is, is more is caught than taught. Oh, well, absolutely. And, 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 for, sh- and for sure, they, they um, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna do what they see, not what they're told. Um, wow, that's, another, another that's really topic, interesting. Another topic we cover is is um, 5 equals 95. So 5 equals 95 is, is basically, to summarize it, is the five people you hang around the most represents 95% of who you are. Mm-hmm. If you hang out with turds, guess what you are? Yeah. You're a turd. Yep. Um, if, you, uh, if you hang out with other kids that are doing drugs, a pretty good chance that, that you're going to do them. Yeah. Or you're going to give a perception to other people that you are also involved in. Yeah. Uh, so you, we we want the parents to set in on these on these bold bold sessions. We mm-hmm. want them there to hear what we're saying. <clears throat> really good. Let me let me ask you. I want to um you know uh, I'm I'm running a little short on time here, and I want to get to one question that that I feel sort of sort of can can go in a million different directions. But I'm going to try and I'm going to I'm going to try and dictate this one and, and steer you in in the you know, in on topic here, the the question is, uh, I usually would say, Hey, if you could wave a magic wand, what's one change it could be made to travel baseball that would have the biggest positive impact. So that's the standard question. I want to edit that a little bit specifically to you. 
and, and I know that you're involved with the ABCA and, and the and the Fast Pitch um, Association. From a from a sort of um, high level, what what could be the way that we um, sort of implement some 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 of these ideas, some of the sort of these uh, mental health um, exercises across travel baseball? Is there a way to do that? I, I think it comes with the education. Uh, I th- you know, with the uh, ABCA and the NFCA, um, you know, we, we do spend time sharing. If you're a member of it, uh, you, you, you get uh, um, emails and stuff and just education. I, I think education is a big part of it. You know, for, for, for like my program here, I have a sports psychologist on staff. She's one of my, she's one of my softball coaches and she has a doctor's degree in sports psychology. So she, she's on staff. And so understanding and recognizing different things that these kids are going to be going through and the different uh, turmoil they're going to face is, is going to be a, a, a pretty big deal. And having, having knowledge of how to, under, how to deal with those things is, is huge, but also you got to educate the parents. I feel like part of my job is to educate the parents about what it's really like. I mean, the, the vast majority of the parents out there didn't play at a college level. I have guys, I have like guys like Sean Barber. Sean Barber's an ex-pro football player. I mm-hmm. played for the Chiefs, the linebacker for the Chiefs. Um, he's got all, all three of his boys are in my program. Uh, Noah's the oldest. He's a senior. And Noah's been here since he was 12, 13 years old. And, uh, but you, you take a parent like uh, Sean and his wife, Nicole, they're, they're awesome parents. They don't get in the way. Mm-hmm. They never come up and go, why isn't, why isn't my kid on the field more? Um, you know what? They, they stay out of the way. Yeah. They know that it's where you're at right now in travel ball is is is, is a beginning, and it, interfering in that is is hard. It's it, more difficult. It it also feels with this with the um, you know approaching the the mental health topic from from a travel baseball perspective. It it's going to require buy in from the coaches from the organization. Not only buy in, it's going to require time. And, 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 you know, I could, I could see there being just this pushback from a, from a, Hey, we, we have limited time with these guys. And, uh, do I invest this time into sitting in the classroom or do I invest this time into BP? Right. So you could, you could feel that there could be this natural, um, opposition, not because the topic isn't great, but, but because, because they're short on time. So there has to be. Um, there has to be buy-in. You can do both. For, correct. There has to you be. You can do both at the same time. There you go. That's it. That's it. I mean, That's honestly, it. like uh, of our BP sessions are, you know, creating competition um, and having a winner and a loser. You know, if we're doing BP session, we play different games and stuff inside. Uh, um, you know, we we have a, a hit tracks you know machine, so we may be doing hit tracks things. Who has I exit velocity? Uh, but we also create competitions, and we. We want to put pressure on players, you know, like just a simple game in a net where ball hits the side net, it's a, it's a one point, ball hits the back of the net, it's worth two points, hits the top of the ceiling, it's minus one. Do these different types of games, come up with whatever you want, but create competition. Mm-hmm. Because somebody has to learn how to deal with the failure of it. Yeah. I think another very important thing that um, I heard one time, I don't remember who said this, but it, I, I love this, 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 this scenario. And I tell all my parents and all my kids at the beginning of the year, I have a meeting with them, and I tell them, I say, all right, there are three types of athletes that I look for. There are eagles, crows, and fence sitters. And I go through what each one of those mean. The eagles are the ones who show up early. They work the hardest. They never complain. They're never a victim. The crows, <clears throat> they complain when they're not batting lead off. They're their victim. Well, the coach doesn't like me, you know. Even though I don't work as hard, I don't put as much time in as the Eagles, but I, I should be treated like an Eagle because I'm here. I'm present. Horse crap. You know, you want to be good at this sport, you got to you log in your hours. And then the other ones are fence sitters. Those are the ones that are stuck between. They're afraid to do one or the other, so they're kind of stuck between. So, yeah. um, so I tell the kids, I said, if I spend my time with the crows, what do the fence sitters become? Crows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. 
if I spend my time with the Eagles, what do the Fence Setters become? Well, they become Eagles. And then some kid will always say, I just got to give it enough time. Some kid will say, what happens to the Crows? Well, the Crows have a choice. And every day you wake up, you have a choice. Do you want to become an eagle, a crow, or a fence center? You have a choice every single day. You can be all three in the same day. But when you start making choices and understand that you, as a 12, 13-year-old, have some control over your life and have ownership over your sport, have ownership over your schooling, your grades, your relationship with your parents, with your friends, you have ownership of all that, and you have a choice every single day. You have a choice whether to do drugs or not do drugs. It's a choice. So... That's one of the things I, I, I wish more coaches would spend more time. I'm just creating competition, helping them with the mental aspect, taking time out of the physical training to just do mental sessions. Yeah. They're so easy to do. It doesn't take much. Kids won't know, won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You have to invest time in them. You have to get to know them on a personal level. Know their family. I have, I have over, you know, I have 35 teams. I have over... 350 kids. I don't even know how many kids and parents I have in this program. I make it a, 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 a plan to get to know every single parent and kid in my program. That's why I'm involved with all the training in this program. I'm every single stitch of it, I'm responsible for. Luke, this has been, um, this has been great. Uh, really important stuff. I, I, hope, I hope there's somebody who hears this and, and it either reemphasizes or or gets them um, interested in in figuring out how they can uh, implement some of these things into their program. Um, I May mean, I really appreciate you coming on, and and I know you and I are gonna are, are gonna keep in touch. I I've, I failed to mention um, you can be found over at, and I'm gonna put this in the show notes on the website, but you can be found at advancedbaseballacademy.com and at ABA underscore elite over on Twitter. Um, again, thank you for coming on. This was great. It was my pleasure, Rich. I, I'm really glad. At any time, I, I would be glad to. And any any coach that wants a little insight on things that I've studied, books that I've read, you know, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is Luke at advancedbaseballacademy.com, and I'll even give you my phone number. There, there you go. Tech, uh, e- email him over there, and you guys can 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 uh, can get together, network, and learn from each other. I, I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Rich. You do the same. Buddy. Bye now.